Good afternoon to everyone. Hope you are doing fine. I am doing fine. I have made it home safely from a long day of work. Traveled mm -hmm. quite a bit mm -hmm. today. But, you know, I'm still thankful that the Lord carried me all the way. So as we get ready, I pray that uh, everyone else has had a wonderful day, that your family is doing fine in the season that we are in. I know there's a lot that, uh, you know, we have on our plates. I uh, certainly want to thank the Lord for all of you tuning in. When you tune in, if you if you can, just say good evening, Sister Davis, Brother Tidwell, everyone else. Good to have you with us. The Tim's family, we appreciate you. I am using one of the wonderful gifts that was given to me for the anniversary service on this past Sunday. It holds quite a bit of coffee. Sister Morris, God, God bless you and your husband as well. Uh, to the Burnett family, I know she'll probably be on here before too long. But let me just tell you, had a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful time on this past Sunday. And I wanted to take time out just to say thank you to everyone. Sister Tapping, God bless you. Glad, hope you're doing well. Uh, that mug is nice, Brother Tim. It is nice. I just wanted to take time out before we get to the questions just to tell everyone thank you for your hugs and your kisses and your prayers and your gifts and your cards and cakes and pies. Uh, most of all, for your love and your support. Uh, we had a strawberry strawberry kind of a cake with some kind of icing and RJ ate the whole thing he got it Sunday today is Wednesday it was gone last night it's it's gone so to, I think sister Banks may have given that sister Fitz gave some pies and cakes as well but to all of you for everything you've done I certainly appreciate you uh, people don't have to do anything for you so Sister Halton, God bless you. Brittany Davis, bless you as well. To the rest of the Davis family, our chairman, Deacon Marcus Davis. I uh, wanted to take time just to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Boy, I tell you, New Hebrew, I, I just cannot imagine being in a better place. And one of my special gifts, oh, I love this. I'm going to keep this forever, Lord willing. You all look at this. Can't tell the difference. Is it me? You can hardly tell the difference, can you? Looks like a mirror. Look at that. Look at that goatee. Look at that. Look at them teeth. That is beautiful. I'm going to keep... And look at this. Now, this is in classic young child style. Look at the word church. See that? I'm going to keep that forever. I'm going to... That definitely has a place on the wall... Lord knows when I get back to the church. I, I saw that I just melted. You know, there's there's nothing like the innocence of a child. I believe Javon and Leah, my little cousins, made that for me and some signs and the coffee that I still have. I'm going to be drinking coffee for a long time. So thank you, thank you, thank you to New Hebrews for the balloons, for the banner, for the filming and all of that, you know. And certainly we won't, don't want to forget it's really the Lord that has made all these things possible. Not only has he taken care of my house, I'm sure he's taking care of your house as well. And so I wanted to greet all of you, say good evening to all of you. I hope everyone has had a wonderful evening. I hope your commute, if you had to work, was fine. For the ones who are retired and are enjoying this second stage of life, we pray that everything goes smoothly for you. And you give me something to shoot forward, something to look forward. You know, I'm certainly looking for that day that I'll have, you know, a, a dime and a nickel, a boot and a shoe to be able to retire and just rejoice after a lifetime of leisure, or excuse me, working, and hopefully get some leisure. I've been working since 14 when I had my paper route, 15th and Lewis, 8th grade. And uh, once you start working, you don't stop. So... Don't worry about the spelling, cuz. He did a wonderful job. That's what makes it beautiful, the spelling. The spelling is what makes it beautiful. So, uh, certainly I got my mug with me. That's actually heavy, to be honest with you. So, what I want you to do tonight, we're going to dive in in just a few minutes with a prayer, a couple of minutes with a prayer. We're going to be in Exodus chapter 34. <clears throat> Exodus 
chapter 34. And then we'll be in Matthew chapter 18. The first question we will address, it will be from Exodus chapter 34. The next question we will address will be from Matthew chapter 18. Uh, I want to show my work. There are some questions uh, from scripture. There are some passages of scripture that God has just not given as much illumination to it as we would like. I think we have enough information for the questions today that we can sufficiently answer them and hopefully help someone along their way with their Bible question and give them some traction in Jesus. Amen. Amen. So to Turner, we enjoy your, hope you are enjoying your retirement. It is 630. Uh, we're going to begin with a prayer and then we'll first go to Exodus chapter 34 followed by Matthew chapter 18. So if you can whisper a word of prayer with me, Father, we come before you as humble as we know how to give honor, to give thanks, to show you just how grateful we are to you for all of your many blessings, many benefits, the favor, the health, the peace of mind, Lord, the comfortable living, the calm to go through a difficult time, the increase of our faith that you have given, your word, how you give us an understanding heart and a bold heart to stand on it and live it. And Father, as we have arrived at this time of study, we pray, Lord, that as we go step by step through your word, that you will lead us, that you can illuminate truth by the power of your spirit. And Father, we are leaning and depending on you. And we're asking you, Father, to be the real teacher. Lord, we pray that we can decrease, that you may increase, that you would be the main show, that all glory would go to you and none to us ourselves. And Father, we ask you this in the name of Jesus. And they all said, Amen. Amen. We appreciate all of you. I had a wonderful day, a good uh, time traveling today. I realized I need to catch up on my sleep because these long drives will expose if you're well rested or not. So uh, what I want us to do, we're going to begin in Exodus chapter 34, and we have to go with the flow of the text in order to find God's viewpoint on this particular biblical question. The first thing we want to assert before we even go through and exegete any biblical text the first thing we want to uh, assert is the supremacy of Scripture, the authority of Scripture. God's word is the ultimate authority on anything in our lives. For the Christian, God's word is really for everyone, but specifically for God's people. We are to be followers and submit to what God's word says. Not what you think, not what I think. Not what you feel, not what I feel, not your tradition, not what you've been doing. God's word overrides how a church votes. God's word overrides what the preacher or pastor or deacon says. God's word overrides what parents have taught us. Parents are fallible. Sometimes parents can be sincere, but they can make mistakes. How many of you have heard, don't go outside with your head wet because you're going to catch pneumonia? You don't catch a cold, rather. Well, a, a cold is a virus. A virus is not spread because your head is wet or your feet are wet and you go outside. It's a good practice to do it, but you don't catch a cold through your head because your head is wet. But we've all heard that. It, it, it's a good practice. I'm not trying to in any way demean anyone's family teaching. Lord, no, I've heard it. But just do a quick Google search. Is a cold a virus? Can you catch it through your head? That device in your hand? will tell you, no, nah, it's not so. Point being, sometimes what we have been taught, although it has been from loving individual, individuals, uh, caring individuals, sometimes it could be wrong. And when we encounter what the truth of Scripture says, we are then expected to follow God and let the chips fall where they may. Now, following God, when it contradicts what we've thought, what we've felt, what we've been doing, or even what we've been taught, if that teaching has been wrong, when we see a right teaching of scripture, if it contradicts whatever or whomever, 
we are to lay it down for the sake and causes of our obedience to Christ. So I say that because the first question is one that is 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 very prevalent. I've heard it asked uh, so many times, and it's um, in the area of generational curse. Is there a such thing as a a generational curse? Your, your, your daddy wasn't no good. You ain't no good. Your, your, your daddy, your, your mother was an alcoholic. Well, you're going to be an alcoholic. Is that biblical? Is sin transferred or hereditary in that way? And so that generally comes from a passage in the Old Testament that has been taken out of context, ripped from its original context, and kind of spread across to make it mean what we want it to mean about how God visits the sins of the fathers to the second and third generation, generational curse. So let's look at Exodus chapter 34. I'll ask you if you don't mind to get your Bibles. And if you don't have your Bibles, you'll look at your electronic devices. And we're going to begin at verse number one. Exodus 34 and verse number one. I'm getting my laptop queued up. Verse one of Exodus 34, it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Hew, or that is to cut, cut to cut thee, cut yourself, two tables of stones like unto the first, like the ones you just had. And I will write upon these tables the words that were in the first tables. And it's that last snippet of verse one, which you breakest, which thou breakest, the ones that you broke. The Lord says to Moses, cut two tables of stone, just like the ones you used to have. I'm going to write the same words on these that I wrote on the first ones. And remember, the first ones, you broke them. That's verse number one. Now, wh what does he mean he broke them? Remember when they came out of four centuries of Egyptian bondage, they made it to the foot of Mount Sinai. God called Moses to the top of Mount Sinai. Joshua, Caleb, and a few others could go kind of halfway. But the rest of the way, only Moses, the glory cloud came, God came, rested upon that mountain, and Moses was with the Lord for, I believe it was 40 days. I want to go back. That's all found in Exodus 32. As Moses was at the top of the mountain, there was something going on at the foot of the mountain. His people, the Israelites, say, this Moses, he's been gone too long. Aaron, we voting you in right now. Make us a God that we can see. It didn't take Aaron long. Moses' own brother. I tell you what, he, he jumped into action. Pastor ain't here. I'm parking in the spot. I'm going in the office. I'm sitting in the chair. Matter of fact, put my name on the church. Aaron jumped into business. Bring me all of your gold, your earrings, your materials. They made a golden calf. God at the top of Mount Sinai, as he was giving Moses the law, those 10 commandments. He said, get down there because I'm going to kill him. Matter of fact, I'm going to destroy all of them. Moses pleaded with God, don't destroy them. What are people going to say? You freed them to bring them out here to kill them? I'm paraphrasing that chapter. When he got down there, he saw the people naked, dancing in all kinds of sexual routines. He was so angry, he took those tablets, Exodus 32 and uh, verse 19, and threw them on the ground and smashed them. Now in verse or chapter 34, verse 1, God is reinstituting that. I'm going to give you back those Ten Commandments. Last time I carved or cut the wood from the mountain, this time you're going to have to do it. I'm going to write with my finger the same words in these that were in the first ones. Verse number 1. Verse 2. And be ready in the morning and come up in the morning unto Mount Sinai. And present yourself there to me in the top of the mount, at the top of Mount Sinai. If you notice in verse 2, morning is repeated. And it's kind of an encouragement as opposed to a mandate. It's more of an encouragement just to remind us or maybe to get us to reflect on the fact that as we, that's my son, God bless his holy soul, to reflect on the fact that morning is a good 
time to kind of get yourself up and meet God before the concerns of the day diminish that desire. Doesn't have to be that way, but it's a good thing, getting up early in the morning to do that. Verse number three, it says, no man shall come up with you. Not Joshua, not anyone, not even halfway. Nobody's going to come up with you. Don't let, neither let any man be seen throughout the mount. I don't even want to see him close to the mount. Neither let the flocks nor herds feed before that mount. Now, in verse 3, God said, I don't want anybody close. I don't want anybody in the way. I don't want anybody coming out. I don't want people walking around it. I don't want your animals around it. I don't want your animals to wander off and you get curious and accidentally get close to the mountain because this is a serious time. This is a serious event. This is a time to where you need to reverence me. And don't forget the last time we were here on the mountain, we were, we remember what happened. So we're not going to repeat that again. And God is just emphasizing in verse three. He said, listen, I don't want anybody wandering the streets. I don't want, I'm saying streets, you know, as an analogy, illustration. I don't, any, I don't want anyone close to the mountain. Don't even let your animals come out. Verse number three, putting this in context. Verse four, God gave instructions and immediately Moses hewed two tablets of stones, just like the first. Moses got up early in the morning and went up unto Mount Sinai, just as God commanded him, and took in his hands the two tables of stone. What we learn from verse four, it said he hewed the stones, that he is Moses, not God. Moses had to put in some work. Disobedience, God will bless you. But sometimes there's a penalty for disobedience. It was a little bit easier last time. Now you're going to have to work a little bit harder this time. And immediately from verse three to verse four, there's action. Moses got busy immediately working for the Lord. There is a lesson in that he has a unhesitating obedience because delayed obedience is equivalent to disobedience. When God tells you to do something, we are not to stall, stutter, or delay. When God says it, he means get busy, unless he tells you at a certain time to do it. But when God gives a command, get busy doing what the Lord says do. If you are harboring sin, foolishness, malice in your heart and you come across a passage of scripture you hear a lecture biblical training you hear a sermon where the word has been exegeted properly and God's word says stop don't do it anymore don't say okay God I heard what you said I'm going to obey next week because Mardi Gras is coming up and we're going to Louisiana no immediately obey because delayed obedience is disobedience. Verse four, Moses does what God says. Verse five, and the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there, that is at the top of Mount Sinai and proclaimed the name of the Lord. This is, this is more like Moses. This is not God proclaiming his name. That's going to happen in the next couple of verses. But this is Moses proclaiming the name of the Lord. Not to go too far into that. That's another way of saying he praised or he worshiped the Lord. He showed the reverence for the Lord. God showed up and he praised. He worshiped. And then in verse 6, now God begins to speak. Verse 6, and the Lord passed before him. And the Lord, that is verse 6, proclaimed. The Lord, the Lord God, God has given his own attributes, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. This is God 
laying out his own resume. This is God giving his own attributes, telling you about himself. God says, I am merciful. I'm sure there are recipients of God's mercy. God says, I am gracious. Mercy has a first cousin named Grace, and they always hang out together. I'm sure we have experienced God being long suffering, slow to anger, deals with us for a long time and also abundant. He has an abundance of goodness and truth. Verse seven is the verse in question. This is where we need to answer the question about generational curses. Exodus 34 Verse seven, you see how we arrive there. Also, not only is God abundant in mercy and truth and grace, uh, long suffering, but it says keeping mercy for thousands. Our God continually shows mercy to thousands and thousands of sinners in all ages, and he will continue to do that to the end of time. God says, I'm a God that keeps my word. God says, I'm merciful and faithful to keep my word and do better for you than you can do for yourself. The God that we serve wants better for us many times than we want for ourselves. Keeping mercy for thousands, reading from the King James rendering, Verse 7 of Exodus 34. Forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. The word forgiven means to, to, to lift the burden. God lifts or carries away the burden of sin from us. Because sin is a weight. Sin is a heavy task, hard task, master. The author of Hebrews, lay aside the sin and the weight that so easily besets us or gets us off track. God lifts that weight of transgression, iniquity, and sin. It is, my son and I, we were, we were trying to move a refrigerator uh, from the kitchen to the garage. We had to go the long way. And I had to lean it my side, lean it his side. And on one time, the, the width of it, the weight of it, the angle he was on, it was too heavy for him. He said, Daddy, 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 Daddy. And I snatched it. I, I, he couldn't handle that weight. He couldn't hold that weight. He couldn't maintain it. He, 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 he couldn't hold it. And if you think you can indulge in sin, iniquity, transgression, and hold that weight, you're fooling yourself. All you have to do is say, Father, forgive me. This is not the life for me. I, when you call on him, the God that we serve forgives iniquities, transgression, and sin. He lifts those weights off of us. And it says, and, now, now it's about to give a contrast. God now giving his own resume, testifying of himself. God is about to give a contrast to his character. What he's saying is, he's saying, listen, there's another side to me. There's a righteous indignation and perfect justice that I execute. Because not only do I love you, my love extends to the point to where sometimes I have to punish you. And, and before we even get to the rest of verse 7, we live in a culture to where people only emphasize one side of God. You know, if you, you know... You know, the phrase, what would Jesus do? And people generally have used it to say, when someone does you wrong, forgive them, let them go. When someone took your money, forgive them, let it go. There is truth to that. Yes, we are to love our enemies. Yes, to we, we are to be people of forgiveness. And does God forgive us? Yes, he does. But verse seven is about to teach you God is not a cosmic pushover. There are times where the dam of God's mercy is lowered and gives way to the waters of God's punishment. 
God loves us. God is long suffering, but God does not allow us to sin continually with immunity. Sometimes God will allow you to sin for a long time. Why? He's long suffering. He's patient. He's not quick to anger. But God does straighten you out. And so that's what this is saying. He keeps mercy for thousands. He forgives iniquities, transgressions, and sin, and will by no means clear the guilty. Somebody can say, well, that's a hard God. That's a mean God. No, it's not. That's a loving God. How many of you out there love your children? The little two-year-old just learning to walk and you know, potty train and learning the first words and the first teeth are coming in and brushing hair and no hair on the sides and the back and only hair on the top. We just love our kid. If that child, that little beautiful toddler with the pampers on and the little flat bottom shoes wanted a chainsaw, it wouldn't matter how much they wanted the chainsaw. You wouldn't give it to a two-year-old child. Why? That's harmful for them. But, but if you don't give it to them, then guess what? It's going to break their heart. And when they get older, when they get 12, 13, 14, if you don't let them do what they want to do, that's going to break their heart. And guess what? Sometimes when you take something from a child, they feelings get hurt and they get mad at you. And guess what mama and daddy got to do? Say, here, son, here, baby, you got something on your behind. Let me knock it off with this belt. You love them when you give them what they want. You love them when you keep from them what is harmful, uh, harmful for them. And you also love them when you have to discipline them. Even the Bible says, whom the Lord loves, he corrects. So the point is, God will by no means, when it says clear the guilty, it doesn't mean he doesn't forgive us our sins and wipe them away. Don't, don't let the word clear get you. It means God by no means will allow you to remain guilty in sin, remain entangled in sin. Sometimes when you know better, especially when you know better, God will punish you out of love. He will by no means clear the guilty. Now we're looking at this verse here. And here it is. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children. That's grandchildren. Unto the third and the fourth generation. There you go. Generational curse. Is that what he's talking about? So if that verse, Exodus 34 and 7, specifically, Exodus 34 and 7, the B portion. If that verse means there is a generational curse, we got dope heads in the family, we got gang members in the family, we got pedophiles in the family, it just runs in our family. We can't do nothing about it. It's a generational curse because the sins of the fathers drop to the children and the children's children, man, this thing can go to three and four generations. If that's true, what about what Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 36? Whom the Son has set free is free indeed. If this is a generational curse, how does that square with 1 John chapter 1, verse 9? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If this is true... It's a generational curse, and you can't help but be angry. That's why you beat your wife. You can't help but go to the bar. That's why I lost my job. You can't help but be a womanizer or a promiscuous woman. My mama was like that. My daddy was like that. If that is true, it's a generational curse. What about when Paul said, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Something ain't lining up here. If this means a generational curse to where it's not possible, I, I can't help but sin. If I can't help but sin because I'm cursed or my whole family lineage bloodline is punished by God, then God, you made me this way. You made me an abusive husband. 
You made me a promiscuous woman. You made me whatever the sin may be. Since you made me that way, you cursed me, my daddy, my granddaddy. How are you going to punish me? How you, you see how that line of logic leads you away from biblical truth. So it, it, it can't mean that because your granddaddy was this way, your daddy was they, this way, that you're going to be this way, and your kid's going to be this way. Because if it means that, what about all these other scriptures? What about repentance? What about when I come to Christ? I'm destined to be a sinner in this way? The answer is no. What the end of verse 7 is talking about is sin's impact is not limited to the individual who commits this sin. This, this whole B portion of chapter 34 of Exodus, verse 7, this whole second section is not about a generational curse, but it shows the generational tendency of wicked behavior of the parents that can influence the children. It shows the influence negatively that parents can have on their children. It does not stop the power of God, but Lord, you show set them behind the starting block a long ways. God is not impotent. God is not powerless. This verse should be a warning to us and a motivation to us. Warning how? Warning because let it be a reminder to you to not play with sin. Because when you play with sin, it doesn't just stick with you. It can affect your children. It can affect your grandchildren. How many of us out there have seen dysfunctional families? Dis, I mean dysfunctional families. The what a mama getting one guy out the front door while somebody coming in the back door and now she got a child by this guy but he got a woman and then the child she got by him don't like the new man she dating and then that little girl at 15 now she pregnant she's in a home where everybody cussing everybody fussing there's dope smoking the cops come out every week the neighbors are mad her boyfriend come over the boyfriend got a new a dysfunction you see how sin can just migrate and just travel that way that's exactly what this second part of verse 7 is talking about the tendency the influence the spread of sin that if you're not careful it can stain a family for generations does not stop the power of god does not mean that you don't have a personal choice every tub sits on its own bottom you have a choice to do what you're doing. Oh, yes, you do. You have a choice. I don't care that your mama was mean to you and put you in foster care. That's hard. I don't care that your daddy never raised you. I don't care that you had to fight in a bad neighborhood. I don't care that it's a liquor store on every corner. There's gangs, there's red, and there's blue. That matters not when it comes to the gospel. But it does show you, look at how sin can stain not only the individual who indulges, but even those closest relationships around him. So let it be a warning. At the same time, let it be a motivation to what? Train up your child in the way that he should go. That when he's old, he won't part from it. You see, the same way you can influence a child for positive or negative things, you can influence a child for positive things. Yes, you can. So when it comes to a generational curse, uh, no, ma'am. No. When you look at Exodus 34, I mean, even the previous verse, verse 6, God just said he's merciful. He's gracious. He's patient, long-suffering. He has an abundance of goodness and truth. It just said he keeps mercy for thousands and thousands and thousands of people. It just said he forgives iniquity and transgression and sin. How could that God not help you get out of sin? I never met my father to this day. Never met my father. Never. Never met him. Somebody said, well, won't you go find him? If I was Shaq, he would have found me. If I was Kobe, he would have found me. I, you can't miss what you never had. But I've never abandoned my kids. So if a generational curse stands true, 
well, why haven't I done what my daddy did to me? Well, why, why haven't I fallen victim to the same foolishness that I've seen fall victim to other, you know, areas of the family? Because everyone has a personal choice. So is there a generational curse? Well, no, no. But can sin infect mama and daddy and infect children and infect grandchildren and that thing can take generations to get out uh yeah that's why you better be careful don't play with sin because once it gets rooted you got a problem on your hand say never tells you the fine print he'll give you your cake now but you're gonna be having crumbs later so i wanted to go through exodus 34 and go over those verses for us. Make sure I got that verse right. Now, I, I hope that answered the question. I could stay on that one all. Let me lighten the mood a little bit. Y'all remember? Look at this. That's me. That's me, y'all. I love that picture, too. All right, all right. Matthew chapter 18. Let's go there. I'm hitting my laptop. Matthew chapter 18. And we're going to start at verse 15. But the question is, can we explain from the Bible what two or three gathered in my name means? And we find that in Matthew 18 and verse 18, 19, 20. But once again, you must go with the flow of the passage. Please have your Bibles open. If you have another laptop, another electronic device, if you have a Bible, the pages, and you're viewing this, please turn to Matthew chapter 18 and verse 15. This passage is talking about keeping the church pure. Be ye holy as I am holy. This passage is talking about uh, church discipline. This passage is talking about the church growing in direct proportion to how it deals with its internal sin. One of the most difficult things to get people to understand and to see that you're not being unloving when you confront someone in their sin. We just saw in Exodus 34, look at what sin can do. Sin cannot just affect a person. It can affect your children's 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 children. I mean, what I'm, I'm, I'm going to make an application here before we go to Matthew 18. What are some of our kids going to say when they become of age and they see the type of pictures that mama is posting on Facebook? What are your children going to say when they get 14? And they start getting interest in the opposite sex. And they see the type of stuff that daddy is putting on the world wide web. What are your grandchildren going to say? When they say, mama, why, grandmama, why would you, what, what is going to be said when you have left on record for free? Your tweets, your TikTok, your Instagram, your Facebook posts, just the pictures you done sent to Joe Blow. And now you and Joe Blow ain't together no more, but he done screenshot every little thing you done showed him. What kind of legacy are we going to leave behind? And when you are a member of a local congregation and you indulge in sin, now, now this text is going to answer the question, ain't nobody your daddy? Ain't nobody your mama. You have the freedom to post, to take a picture, or whatever you want to. It is a free country. Nobody can make you or not make you do anything that you want to or don't want to do. You can do it to your heart's desire. If you like it, I love it. However, in a local congregation, there is an accountability that we all have one to another. An accountability to love and even to correct when a brother has stepped, a brother or sister has stepped out of line. That's what this is talking about. Moreover, if your brother, Matthew 18, verse 15, if your brother trespass against you, 
Go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Lord Jesus, stop telling everybody else but haven't told that person. Stop spreading it up to everybody else, but don't tell that person. I'm going to, and Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm going to make this very uh, serious analogy. This has happened to me once, I'll say twice, three times, from the time I preached my first sermon until today. Three times I've gotten kind of a letter, a message, a note, mainly typed to where somebody will mail it or slide it under your door. I'm like, what? And normally, boy, people talk reckless. They talk, whoo, Jesus. People can get nasty on the computer typing and punching. And I'd be like, why, why wouldn't they just, whoever this anonymous person is, why wouldn't they just call me? I'm not unapproachable. I, I try not to be. I've, I've never been, never tried to be, hopefully I never have, condescending, mean, crude, brash, obnoxious. I've always tried to listen to whomever and whatever. That's hard because sometimes people may not be as cordial, but why wouldn't they just write it? Look at how people are bold enough to write it but ain't brave enough to sign it. I've never had anyone sign it. Now, well, once, once, but they were a thousand miles away. Matthew, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said, you go to your brother and tell him by yourself. And it said, if he hears you, if he says, you know what, man, I'm sorry. You, you, you're right, you've shown me in scripture. That's wrong, that action, that decision, that attitude. That's wrong. The purpose for doing it is to gain your brother. Not to fight your brother, not to embarrass your brother, not to hurt your brother, but to gain your brother. Behold how pleasant and beautiful it is when brethren dwell together in unity. Sin breaks that unity. I want to bring it back. I want her to come back. I want everything to be peaceful. In order to have peace, we must discuss the problem. Let me lovingly, privately do that. Alone. Verse 15. But if he doesn't hear you, if they don't understand, if they don't agree, if they just flat out say, I ain't studying what you're talking about. If they say those dreadful, foolish words, I know what the Bible says, but, oh, Lord, that's, that's scary. If they will not hear you, now take one or two more. That means you got the initial person and then you got one or two more. You got the one person and then you got one or two more. So that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. That's the Jewish way of verifying truth. You recruit somebody else. Now, 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 listen. You should have a good gauge on who's spiritually mature. Don't just take the person in the choir to talk about everybody. Don't just take your friend, your, your cousin, or whomever, family member. You know they ain't studying the Bible. They don't even come to church. You know how they live their life. They, not, they don't pray. They don't value the word. Don't take someone like that. That's foolish. Take somebody that is spiritually mature, that you can trust, that is grown up in the faith, that you three can look at it and say, have I missed something? And they say, no, that's you, you're correct. That brother or sister is kind of getting into some pretty deep waters. I tell you what, let us have a prayer. Let's read the scripture. Let's go talk to them. Take two or three witnesses with you that every word may be established. Verse 16. Verse 17. What if he doesn't hear them, the two or three, all of you together? Well, you have no other recourse but to tell it to the church. That's what this is talking about. Discipline. It, if, if the individual doesn't work, if the group doesn't work, now we need to hold church to know. Now, now, 
put this in context, depending on the nature and the extent of the sin, because everyone that is a member of a local body is not saved, and everyone that's a member of a local body is not strong, you must be very wise and careful what you say and how you say. Uh, from studying this, I had to refresh my mind on it uh, and my heart. You want to make sure that you give enough information so that it is clearly known this is serious. Don't give so much every jot and tittle and detail that you actually make it harder for the person to ever come back if they do repent. So the point is, you tell it to the body, not so the body can look down on them and shun them. You tell it to the body, the church, so that now all of you can go bring this brother or sister back. Okay, this is a this is a mass effort now. This is this is a search party. Hey, brother, we praying for you. We 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 praying with you. Come on, sister. You know better than that. Listen, you, you, we miss you. You know what the Bible says. That's the mindset of verse seventeen of Matthew eighteen. But if he neglects to hear the church, if they choose their sin over their God, if they choose their sin over what the Bible says. If they choose their sin over what is clearly seen in scripture to be the right thing to do, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Now, what does that mean? You can't kick nobody physically from the building where the church meets. That building ain't the church anyway. That building is where the ecclesia, the called out ones, the one who are called out of darkness into the light, that building of bricks and mortar and wood with a cross and a steeple and pews and an organ and a pulpit, that's where the church meets. And so now this person cannot function as a member of the church. I love you, but you can't teach Sunday school no more. I love you, pay attention, but you can't serve in the deacon ministry anymore. I love you, but you're not going to be teaching that class anymore. I love you, but you can't sing in the choir no more. I, I, I love you, but you can't play the piano, guitar, organ, the drums. We, we, we don't want this to happen. But if we know you in sin, if we tried to get you out of sin, if we prayed about this sin, if we shown you in scripture where it's sin, if it's been private, if it's been two or three, and now it's the whole church, and you're still clinging to something that is clearly forbidden in scripture, and we just allow you to function with immunity. Now as a church, a group of body of believers, we give the impression that what you're doing is okay. It must be okay. Look, everybody know he's doing it. He's still on the drums. She's still over there. He's still doing this. So tell it to the church and you must treat him as a heathen man and a publican. Meaning, we're going to love you from afar now. Keep, keep coming because you need to hear the word. But you can't participate in ministries. Now we get to the verses in question. Verily, verily, truly, truly, verse 18. Lord, please, I hope y'all have your Bibles open. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Please, 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 Lord Jesus, pay attention. Because this question is talking about what about the two or three gathered in my name? What does that mean? The question is, what does it mean to have two or three gathered in my name? We started at Matthew 18, verse 15, 16, 17. Now we're in verse 18 of Matthew 18. And in essence, what it is saying, it's on the tail end of verse 17. It's saying, you have told an individual, brother, we love you, sister, we love you, but no. We, 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 we've tried all, we know how to try. We've been patient, we know Oh, but we know Exodus 34, what sin can do, not just to you, but to your wife, to your son. What's your son going to think? What's your daughter going to think? you a grandfather. What's your grandchild going to think? It's going to affect so much more, not just your personal family, but your church family. So we're going through these steps, not just to keep the church pure, but to hopefully gain our brother or sister back. Since that hasn't worked, the ultimate step Listen, keep coming, but you can't participate. Mm -mm, can't do it. Verse 18. And whatever you bind on earth, the way it's written in Greek, it's already been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth has already been loosed in heaven. That's the way it's written in the Greek. 
Well, what does that mean? That means once you have taken these steps, once you have gone down this line, once you have done what God has wanted you and called you and showed you in the Bible to do, heaven ratifies, validates what you have done concerning discipline as it lines up with God's will. What, what, what happens is there's a, a word in here I want us to look at. Oh, that's, that's in the next verse there. But what, what happens is it says whatever, it said, whatever you bind on earth. That means if you see a person and they still are bound up, they're still holding on tight to their sin. That what that means is a person that indulges in their sin. And you say, brother, there's there's no contrition. You you still doing that sister. You still involved in that. We we're going to love you out of this. But you haven't repented. You haven't not even told us you're sorry. You haven't shown God you're sorry because you're doing the same thing over and over and over again. That means it's bound. You, you, you're still tied up in it. And God is saying, I can see it too. And guess what? I co-sign that. He's still bound in his sin. Or if they repent and they say, this is not the life of me, I'm sorry. Can y'all pray with me? Can y'all pray for me? And listen, this is why the church needs to be mature. This is why the church needs to be a place of love and not gossip and slander and rumors and laughing at folks and talking about folks and looking down on folks and trying to make yourself better than folks. Why? Because in that environment, who wants to say they sorry? But when you know you got someone that love God, someone with a gentle, kind, and meek spirit, a man that is kind and wise and mature, and yes, he's stern when he says you can't, but yes, he's just as receiving when he sees that you let go of your sin. If, they, if it's loosed on earth, if they let go of that sin, guess what? Heaven says, I see it too. Let that sister back in the choir. Let that man back on the drums. It's loosed in heaven. And verse 19 kind of echoes the same thing that verse 18 has just been talked about. And, and verse 19, pay attention here. Verse 19. Again, I say, meaning... I'm going to repeat the same theme in verse 19 as I just told you in verse 18. Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth touching anything that they ask, it shall be done for them of my father, which is in heaven. This does not mean if two of you make your mind up, you can pray and make God do what you want him to do. No, I can't tell you how many times I've heard that. You know, the church won't brown carpet. You want red carpet. Brown is for dirt. We ain't dirt. Red is for the blood. We want blood. Come on, girl. Let's hold hands and pray. Touch and agree that we're going to ask God. And if we ask him, he got to give it to us. <laughs> Let me hold my peace. No, th that is not anything to do. That has nothing to do with what this passage is talking about. If two of you shall agree, the word agree is a Greek word, symphonio. It's almost like symphony. That Greek word means harmonious or harmonious. If you guys can harmoniously see, you, you, you agree that there's a harmony, there's a unity. When you come together and agree, touching anything. Well, what do you mean touching anything? Like laying hands on each other? No. It means concerning the act of discipline. Well, why would he have to say that? Because when you discipline someone, there is an overwhelming pressure from the unchurched, an overwhelming pressure from well-meaning Christians sometimes that are not bold enough or strong enough to do it, to change your mind. I mean, we know she a stripper. We know she go to Memphis on the weekend and show her body for dollars. But why she can't lead the song? We know she put herself half naked on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, uh, whatever else is out there. We, Paris, I don't know, Zoom. We, we know she naked and she promiscuous. And, but she really, really, really can sing. Why y'all tripping about that girl being in the, in the choir? I mean, come on, Pat. Pat, don't you have love? That pressure, that's when he says, if you get together 
with the two or the three. Now, now remember, if two of you still referring to the two or three, the two or three refers to the discipline, verse 16 of this particular chapter. If, if, if two of you, the lowest number of the two or three, if, if, if two of you can agree touching anything concerning anything about discipline, as long as it lines up with the Bible, pray, ask, Lord, help us. Lord, give us a peace. Lord, give us a guidance. And God will give it to you. This is not a blank statement that you can just get two people together and they can make their mind up and agree and you force God to give you what you want. It don't even have to be two people because what if one person prays? God won't answer that. Or what if two people pray and they hold hands, they really earnest, but they asking God for a sinful thing that has nothing to do with prayer meeting. Verse 20, last verse, and we're done. For where there are two or three gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Now, I want to ask y'all something. How many times have you heard this at prayer meeting? How many times have you been to a service and everybody was expecting some large congregation, ain't but a few folks there, and the preacher comes to the mic, where the Bible say? Well, there's two or three gathered in my name, there I'm in the midst. That has nothing to do with Matthew chapter 18, verse 20. Nothing to do with small numbers at prayer meeting, Bible study, Sunday school, morning worship, three o'clock program. Nothing to do. It says, but when you get together, it's still using the phrase two or three. Remember, the two or three was established in verse 16. The two or three, get somebody to come with you because if within the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. He finishes out in verse 20 that where there are two or three, this whole section is talking about church discipline, not about getting your prayers answered to what you want because you're touching somebody's hand, not about getting a blank check when it comes to talking to God, not about the small amount of people that come to a service. Nothing to do with that at all. The two or three has to do with when you perform church discipline. And it's hard. And Jesus said, you might have the deacons against you. You might have the choir that don't agree. You might have the choir saying, we know she is stripper. We know she posed naked and nude, but we still want her to sing. And we side with her and we calling you a mean old fuddy-duddy. You might have the preacher saying, now, come on, baby. Church got to have money. And when she sings, she bring in money. Well, you may have all the excuses coming down on you. But if there's two or three gathered together in my name, doing my work, what I say do according to God's word, you might feel alone, verse 20, but you're not alone. You might feel abandoned, verse 20, but, but it says you're not abandoned. Your husband may not understand. Your spouse may not like it. The deacons may not get it. The choir may be mad at you. The ushers ain't going to do this. So-and-so ain't going to do it. You get all kinds of pressure dropping on you. He said, but if you're doing what I say, if you're doing when I say it, if you do what I say, when I say it, if you obey scripture, you gather together in my name because it ain't your authority. It's mine. He said, guess what? I am with you. And Christ being with you is not having some goosebumps, you know, and you can feel a wind blow and your hair moves. No, you have to read what he says and accept it by faith. God, I know it's right. I know this what you said, dude. And sometimes the external pressure can make you think God ain't with you. If he was with you, why would everybody be against you? But I heard my Bible say, if God be for you, it's more than all the world against you. So when the Bible talks about the two or the three or gathered in my name, start at Matthew 18, read verse 15 to 20, study it, get a Matthew Henry's commentary, go to a web website, preceptaustin.com. 
dot o r g p r e c e p t a u s t i n dot o r g. Find Matthew 18 in there. Find it in a, a basic commentary. It's got nothing to do with prayer service. Nothing to do with, I'm going to touch your arm. So when I touch and agree, that means now your prayer really going to be that. No. The two or three in my name, the witnesses, is talking all about church discipline. And to anybody on any level who has ever tried to lovingly, privately correct somebody when they are obviously wrong in the church, you know from personal experience, not just from what Jesus is saying, it can really go awry. You can be right and still be called wrong. So that question about explain the two or three gathered in my name, I hope that has shed at least some light on it. If nothing else, we know what it's not. And let this second question, church discipline, kind of springboard off of the first question about visiting the sins in third and fourth generation because look at what sin can do. So we'll 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 stop right there. It's, we'll we'll go ahead and pause. I wanted to 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 share that with you. Uh these are some very very good questions. Very it's more than just read Matthew 18 and 20 or more than just read Exodus 34:7b. No, you have to show show your work. Once again, my preference, your preference. Your tradition, my tradition. Well, when I, I'm going to paraphrase some statements. Well, when I read it, this is what I get out of it. You could be right. You could be wrong. Because what you get from Scripture, what if what I get from Scripture contradicts what you got from Scripture? Well, we both can't be right. There is a systematic way of studying God's word. When you exegete the scriptures, God has an intended meaning from his word, whether you never existed or not, brother or sister. So stay in the word. I, I pray that somebody has been uh, edified, uplifted, and helped. Uh, we're going to close with a prayer, and then we'll let you enjoy the rest of your evening. Uh, hopefully this has been beneficial to, to some and instructive at the least. So if you don't mind, let's bow for a word of prayer and let's talk to God. Lord, thank you. Thank you, Father, for goodness, grace, mercy. Thank you for being a long-suffering God. Thank you for being a God that keeps your word. And Father, you have done just what you said you would do. Individually, Father, we may have more than some, less than others, but you have definitely supplied our needs. May not have what we want, but Father, when you give us our needs and we walk in obedience, there have been times to where you have given us the desires of our heart. And I just want to pause right now and pray for the ones who are teaching all across the land, the churches that are open, the churches that have not yet reassembled, the decision-making process, Father, there's just so much to consider and People just don't know sometimes what to do. But Father, we're going to look to the hills from whence cometh our help because all our help comes from you, God, that created the heavens and the earth. Bless our seniors. Bless our children. Bless the choir of this church, Father, all of our leaders. Bless the ministries of New Hebron. Bless your church as a whole, not just this local church, but the church all over the land, the universal church, the people in different continents, different cities, different states different situations that are still a member of the ones that have been blood washed and spirit filled. Bless them right now, Father, for the ones who are going back into the schools, for the children that are going back into schools, for the parents that are struggling with child care situations, Father, and don't know what to do, for the woman that has to be mama and daddy and wear two hats, fulfill both roles. God, we just ask you a grace and a mercy for them. We pray that you can take care of them as only you can. For the ones that are in various circumstances and situations, relationships, financial, health, job, whatever it is, we know that you know. We don't have to know about it because we can't do anything about it, but we can put it in your hands. 
knowing that you have all power to handle it in any way you see fit. Thank you for this time of study. Thank you for the ones who have stayed with us. Thank you for the ones that have come. We pray that you can continually use this means to get your word out. And we ask you this in the name of Jesus. They all said, amen. Amen. Uh, Precept Austin. I see that question. Precept, P-R-E-C-E-P-T. Austin, like Austin, Texas. Precept Austin, one word. Dot O-R-G. Precept Austin dot O-R-G. Wish I could type in here. I might be able to type in here, but I don't know how to do it. But anyway, I, I appreciate your time. Uh, I certainly appreciate it. It's on my desk. You can't see it here. This coffee, it will not go to waste. It has found a good home. So I appreciate you. Sister Brown, God bless you as well. Sister Tim, thank you, Sister Tim. Look at that. God bless you. Look at that. God got a ram in the bush. Our choir president, Brother Tidwell. Oh, Atlanta Hawks. Look out now. And, and people, before we sign off, I just had a thought. We had such a sweet time of Fellowship Sunday and just standing around taking pictures. Hadn't seen everybody collectively together since, what, March, April? And listen, we had a good time. Everybody had their mask and hand cleaner. And we did the distancing as best that we could. Kids were having fun. Listen, maybe sometime in the fall, y'all just think about it, there's nothing set. Maybe sometime in the fall when there's no humidity, maybe one morning or maybe one evening, just whatever, on a weekend or whatever, we can meet down there at a certain time, have a little food, and we can have a lesson together. Or maybe we can just have us a fellowship. Just some people out there on the grass, some people in their cars, we got some smoked meat, we got some turkey burgers for you healthy folks. We got Fiji water. And for the more urban, we got some good old Kool-Aid, some red Kool-Aid. But I'm, I'm being funny, but just kind of think of it, you know, just pray about it. You know, there's nothing definite. We want to be safe. But I think that fellowship was just so sweet. Hadn't seen everyone in a while. And maybe we can do that to get back out the house and for the seniors that may not want to be around everybody, they can park their car sideways and have their window down and we can walk by and say hi and Pass a little juice and have a little cake or something. Who knows? So just keep it on your heart. Keep it on your mind. I'll be praying. And Lord willing, we can get together again. Uh, as of right now, I'm finna go get on to my son. Come in here messing with the ice maker. Why you gotta mess with the ice maker when I'm recording? Yeah. Tell you what, some some ain't right. Some ain't right. Y'all, y'all. If you don't see him no more, you know what happened to him. Amen. So I'll catch up to him. God bless you. God keep you. Sister Youth Director, the best youth director on this side of heaven, Sister Ashley C. Brown. She said, let's do it. Amen. You guys enjoy your evening, and I can't wait to see you guys soon. Lord willing, we'll do this again Sunday morning with our Sunday school lesson. God bless you.